Give the Lord the praise one more time in this house. I love his good presence. I love the joy of the Lord. We worship with joy and we worship with passion because God is a God of joy. The joy of the Lord, he renews my strength, is my strength. I'm thankful to him today. Uh, you may be seated in his presence today. <clears throat> Can it? It's hard to believe this is the last Sunday of this month, and we were just celebrating New Year, and the year is rolling on, isn't it? And we need to be serious about being about the Father's business, because time is running out. Everybody say time. And we're going to talk about time this morning. <laughs> and, and so I'm going to look at our verse of Scripture. I know I was a break off last week. Our brother uh, Jason preached for us enjoyed his company. Uh, he's back in England, but I'm jumping back into the series I've been in, and I need to finish it next week as we launch into the Easter resurrection celebration, uh, remembrance of the passion of the Christ, the cross, and the grave, and the resurrection will be the message of the hour in March. So today and next Sunday, I will finish this series trusted. And so our text I've been preaching from all month long is in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 2. Everybody say trusted. And it says this, Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found, everyone say that loud, faithful. And so a refresher today for those of us that maybe it's the first you're hearing in the ser series a steward is someone who has been made a manager of someone else's property. Did y'all catch that? A steward is someone who has been made a manager of someone else's property. The steward has been entrusted to faithfully handle that which has been placed in their hands. And I'm driving this truth home today that we are stewards. We are managers of what belongs to God. And what belongs to God? Everything. God owns it all. Look at your neighbor and remind them this morning. God owns it all. And that which he places in our care is called blessings. Did y'all get that? God owns everything, but what he puts in our hands is called blessings. And some people overflow with more blessings than other people because they have been deemed trustworthy to handle it well. If you don't believe that's how God works, look at Matthew 25 and the parable of the talents where the master distributed, but one was given one, another five, and another ten, each according to his ability. God distributes his blessings according to our ability to handle it well. And, and I want to remind us that every good thing comes from above, whom the Father of glory gives to us for us to enjoy. I have to recognize today my spouse, my children, my children's children, any property I own, any finances that come my way, my time, my gifts, my talents, my job, the ministry that God has put in before me. God owns it all. Everybody with me this morning? And I am just a steward. You are just a steward. And the question is, are we trusted stewards over what God has given us? Are we trustworthy managers? Now, here's a secret I've been throwing at you. I'm going to throw at you today and probably again next week. My ability and faithfulness as a steward determines the level of my blessing. Did y'all hear that? 
My ability and faithfulness as a steward determines the level of my blessing. So if you want to move forward in your life, learn to manage well. Present yourself as a trustworthy manager of your blessings. So here's what we're learning. As stewards, we must handle it well. We must handle it faithfully. We must handle it with accountability. And we must handle it as one who is trusted. Everybody shout trusted. trusted. Now, can God trust you? Is God able to trust you with more? But here's the beauty of trust. It's a two-way relationship. Now, let me show you this. God is trusting me, or God trusting me, is often dependent on the level that I trust him. Let me say this again. God trusting me is often on the level with me trusting God. So lack of trust on our part is what causes us to act in an untrustworthy manner. When I don't trust God, I begin to act in an untrustworthy manner in my life. And when we act in an untrustworthy manner, then God is not able to trust us with more. Did y'all get that? I don't trust God, so I act untrustworthy. And when I act untrustworthy, God can't trust me. It's a two-way street. And so when we want, if we want to release more blessings, we need to learn to handle well that which God has placed in our hand in a trustworthy way. Listen, without trust in God, we will continue to resort to our carnal, secular, faulty, fear-based way of handling life, which often leads to us being untrustworthy. Is this making sense this morning? And so here is how it works. It is trust in God that I faithfully release the first fruit of my tithes to him, trusting that the promise to come is going to bring come to fruition and the remainder in my life is sanctified and that God will stay the hand of the thief and the devourer. It is trust in God that I sow the spiritual seed of offering and giving into the kingdom, to the needs of those suffering, to the missionary, to the mission work and to the needs in the local body, believing that whatever I sow and to the level that I sow, God will cause me to reap abundantly. It's trust in God that I give to the needs of the poor and help in our outreach to those without, believing what God promised, that giving to the poor is like lending to God and he will pay back. It's trust in God that I don't look to gain this honestly or a quick for a quick financial gain through gambling or chance or defrauding another or are driven by covetous greed it's trust in God that I don't allow myself to who's been set free by him to come under the bondage of the debtor it's trust in God that I don't spend more than I have or purchase with money that I don't have because trust causes me to handle it in God's way the spiritual way the biblical way it's all right this morning guys now, it's, it's because of lack of trust that many lay up at night worrying about what's coming tomorrow. It's because of lack of trust that many live in anxiety over their financial state. It's lack of trust that couples are at each other's throats fighting over money and material things. It's lack of trust that many are applying fleshly and secular methods to financially get ahead. It's lack of trust that has many laying around waiting on the government or big brother or some agency to come rescue them and take care of them financially. Come on, somebody. But lack of trust produces untrustworthy
behavior. And my untrustworthy behaviors keeps God from trusting me with more because trust is a two-way relationship. Everybody on board. If I'm going too fast, uh, speed up your hearing aids because we, we got a lot to say this morning, guys. And so, listen, I pray, before I go any further, I pray that you're developing the trust and joy of, of learning to faithfully tithe and give an offerings. I pray you're learning this. And I pray, and not under a legalism of the law way, but a faith and covenant, the joyful worship under the blessing of Abraham to the priesthood of Jesus Christ. And I want us to learn to be good managers of our treasure. But what I'm going to speak to us about today is about our time. Everybody say time. Now, somebody said it like me, time, time, All right? Believe it or not, we're called to be good stewards of our time. Can we talk about time for a few moments this morning? You heard of time management? Well, guess what? That originates with God himself. Our time on earth is a blessing, not a guarantee. In our time management or in our management of our time, we need to pause this morning and consider God and time. Now, one thing I want us to understand about God is that there is nothing chaotic about God. He's never in a rush. He's never running late. He's never pressed for time. He's never found racing against the clock. The clock doesn't catch him off guard. He never is late. He doesn't even have an alarm clock. In fact, one of the things that you can rely on with our God is that he is an on-time God. And God is also a God of order and timeliness. And this is a truth about his very nature and his character. God now is outside of time. He, he's timeless he existed in eternity past and, and, and ageless infinity. Yet, when it comes to humanity, he, and you read through the Bible from cover to cover, you will find that the Bible reads like a finely tuned timepiece, faithfully ticking by the perfect and ordered plan of God for mankind. And so we see this timeless God uh, begins the order of time in Genesis 1.14. Before this, there were no calendars, there were no clocks, there, were, there was no such thing as time and age. But now in Genesis 1.14, God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and seasons for days and years. Listen, nothing just happens in the Bible. It operates on the perfect time clock, faithfully, orderly, and timely. That is God's way. You know the word time occurs in the English translation of the Bible over 1,000 times? And in addition to that, you have phrases like fullness of time, at the appointed time, or when the time was fulfilled repeatedly in the scripture when in reference to God's plan and purpose. When we look at the cross, the crucifixion is documented on a series of hours, the sixth hour, the ninth hour, etc. The sending of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost is, is documented as having happened at the third hour of the day. And you see this pattern in the scripture. Why? Because God is a God of time, order, and timeliness. There's a lot of characteristics about God that we're called to imitate. A God's a God of mercy, so we're called to be merciful. God is a kind God, so we're, show, we're called to show kindness. God is love, so we're commanded to love one another. God is holy, so we are called to be holy as he is holy. But what about God being timely? Oh, y'all real quiet now, is it? That's a characteristic of God. 
And if God is a God of timeliness and order, if he's an on-time God, how are we reflecting him? Can we be trusted with our time? Are you, let me ask you, don't raise your hand, uh, uh, but are you chronically late in life? <laughs> Any chronically late people in the house? <laughs> now, my wife knows our biggest class when we first got married was this issue because I can't stand being late. That's my pet peeve. I, I just don't like being late. I'd rather be two hours early to something than five minutes late. That's a fact. And, and, and among the military, at least in the Navy, uh, we had a saying, if you arrive 15 minutes early, you're late. And that's just my mindset. I, I'm not one of these guys that says, well, it only takes 50 minutes, 15 minutes to get there, so I'll leave 15 minutes before time. I don't do that. I say, it takes 15 minutes to get there, but what if there's traffic? What if it's an accident? What if we have a flat? I factor in all that to make sure I'm not late. Right? Anyone else like that? I'm the only one. <laughs> Listen, uh, the psychology, the psychology of being chronically late, uh, psychologists have studied this, and there's reasons why some people are just perpetually late. One is uh, late people hate being early. <laughs> That's just a fact. In their minds, being early is not a value. In fact, they even see it as being dead, waste, waste of, wasted dead time, right? Uh, sometimes being chronically late is a type of passive aggression, uh, a way of exerting control, a type of resistance carried over from their childhood. They like creating this mini crisis of running late and the adrenaline rush of it. Um, or sometimes they're just really bad time managers, <laughs> right? They have no idea how to estimate how long it will take to get ready and travel to their destination, right? And uh, the good thing in our marriage is now my wife says, what time do we need to leave? And that really, that question has changed the world. Because then I say, we need to be in the car pulling out the driveway at this time. Okay. And that's what we do. That, and there are no more arguments, right? But, but, but some people just don't manage time well. Sometimes chronically late people are narcissists. Uh, it's a form of getting attention, getting noticed, standing out, making the grand entrance, right? Uh, but, and, and they say if you're chronically late, at least 10 minutes late to everything, no matter what, uh, definitely there's some internal issues happening. And, and the bottom line is you just don't want to be on time. <laughs> All right, and late people, I'm talking to late folk in the house. At, at, at minimum, being late uh, can be an irritant to others, but sometimes it can send also a strong statement. And, and, and so this is a big thing uh, for me, but, but let me, you know, through the years I've had these experiences, I've done tons and tons of weddings, hundreds of weddings and funerals, and I've always been amazed uh, at some of the stuff I've seen. One, one year I was doing a wedding for a young couple, and I also had an event afterwards, and I said, I'll be glad to do your wedding. I'll drive all the way across Houston to do your wedding, but I have to leave at this certain time because I have an event I can't miss. They said, okay, guess what? Wedding was supposed to start at one time. The bride showed up an hour late. Didn't call. Hey, I'm running late. Traffic, nothing. Just sashayed in an hour late. I, I did that wedding, but I had an attitude because I knew I was going to be late to my appointment, right? I can't stand being late. Uh, one wedding I was doing, we, the, 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 the mother of the groom showed up an hour and a half late to the wedding, her son's wedding. But it wasn't that she was just late, that no one wanted to start until she got there. So we spent an hour and a half of different people going up showing their talents, singing, poetry, whatever, just to entertain the crowd while we were waiting on the dude's mother to get to the wedding an hour and a half late. And it wasn't that there was traffic because this was a small rural lakeside town. There was no traffic. But just an hour and a half late, just showed up, no excuse, didn't call, oh, I'm sorry, just walked on in when it was ready for, she was ready. I, I can't wrap my mind around that. One time I was doing a funeral, and the mother of the deceased girl showed up an hour late. 
And I had an angry funeral director who had another funeral next, and we were still hadn't even started an hour into our time. This is just beyond my comprehension. As a pastor, I, I, there was one pastor who, who started service at various times. They're supposed to start at a certain time. He may start 15 minutes late, 30 minutes late, 45 minutes late. He would stand at the door waiting. Well, we can't start because the Joneses aren't here. We can't start because the Smiths aren't here. Wait a minute. We still can't start because this family hadn't shown up. And he would wait till all the right families were there. And then he'd start. What he did was train the church folk. It won't start till I get there. I took over from him and I changed it to we start right on time. And the first few Sundays, there were five people in the house, but we started on time. Yeah. It took a while, but people realized they start without me. You better believe it. Pastor Provozic's now here. I like to start on time. We don't do late. <laughs> I'm off my soapbox now. Listen. <laughs> But if we're going to be good stewards of our time, how can a God, an on-time God, trust us in handling the works of his hand if we don't reflect his timeliness? Y'all with me, guys? I think sometimes God tells us, I can't place this work in that person's hand because I can't trust them to operate on my timeline. Are y'all with me, guys? When God says go, he's not speaking to the hesitator. When God says go, he's not speaking to the one who delays. When God says go, it's not to the one who responds, yeah, but when I'm good and ready, Lord. When God says go, it's not to those who'll show up after the door has been shut, after the ark has been closed, after the wedding celebration has started, after the trumpet has sounded, after the midnight call has gone forth. It's to those who he is able to say, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been and faithful with the little bit. Now I'm going to trust you with more. That's the God. That's his nature. Y'all with me, guys? I'm going to shout time. So show up. Be present. Be counted. Be represented and be on time. Turn your neighbor and say, be on time. Time. See, Ephesians 5 and 1 says this. If God's an on-time God, a God of time and order, he says, therefore, be imitators of God, dear children. That's what he said. Look what he says in Ephesians 5, 15 through 16. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Get this. Redeeming the time. Another version says making the most of your time. Because the days are evil. But that's not all about time management I'm going to talk about. It's, it's a godly thing to be on time and, and show up. But listen, time management is more than just being on time. It's because time is measured for us in hours and days, weeks, months, and years, right? But you know what drives us crazy? It's the hour. <laughs> because especially in the West, and uh, I, I'm not real old, but I've been pastoring long enough to know this patterns. And, and 30 years ago, still 30 years ago, in the typical American church, and I don't know what was being done here in Europe or in Asia and other places, but in the typical American church in the South, we had Sunday school at 945, and then church service started at 1045, and then Sunday evening service at 7 o'clock, and then Wednesday service at seven o'clock. And then sometimes we in my church, Saturday night prayer meeting at seven o'clock. That was your church week schedule all the time. And I started noticing in the nineties, uh, that families began to do this trend of overloading themselves such that it started affecting Sunday evening and Wednesday evening services. Y'all know what I'm talking about, church. Soccer, cheerleading, dance, baseball, football, Bonco's group, and, and parents began to load their kids up with more activity than any one child should be able to process. And the result was and is that the thing that kids needed the most suffered. 
And that was spending time. Did y'all hear me? I'm talking about face-to-face -face time, one-on-one -on -one time, family sitting around the dinner table together time. Y'all with me, guys? And I, and I noticed that this busyness and this overload led to decreased time for the house of God. Sunday school today almost does not exist anywhere. And, and, and then uh, midweek services all but have disappeared. Uh, Sunday evening services, nobody has Sunday night church. And I love Sunday night church. That was the service where we showed up at 7 and the Holy Ghost moved and we got home at 11 at midnight, right? That's, that's, that was the service I love. Nobody has Sunday night services anymore. And we've kind of condensed it to match the busy time schedule of the average Western family. We have lost the value of worshiping God with our time. Somebody shout time. I'm talking about worshiping God with our time because there is this powerful spiritual truth behind the Sabbath rest. Long before the law of Moses, God himself demonstrated the principle of a Sabbath rest. In Genesis 2, on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and rested on the seventh day. Did God get tired? No. That meant he ceased from doing all of his work, which he had done, and God blessed that seventh day. He sanctified it because in it he rested or ceased to work the work which God had created and made. This was practiced by God himself before man was ever invited into this. A day set aside to cease from doing, to end the busyness. I like to call it a divine pause. All beautiful music will have rest and pauses. And the music that is our lives should include divine rest and pauses as well. Centuries, centuries later, after God first rested on a day of rest, the law of Moses codifies the Sabbath, and now it's included in the Ten Commandments as the fourth command. But the principle of divine pause existed before the law, and it continues after the law in the New Testament church. We call it the Lord's Day. Y'all taking notes. Write that down. The Lord's Day. I didn't make that name up. That's what it was called in the book of Acts. The Lord's Day. Uh, so it's not my day. It's not your day. It's not even your family's day. It's definitely not NFL football's day. It's the Lord's Day. He owns the day. And because we are first fruit believers and everything about Christian worship is centered around first fruit, our day of rest is not on the last day as the Jews did under the law, but it is on the first day of the week. If I with me, we call it Sunday. Now, Justin Martyr was a first Christian apologist in about the year 150 A.D. He's writing this letter to the Roman governor explaining the practices of the Christians. And he told the Roman governor this. We meet on the first day of the week because it was on this day that Jesus rose from the grave. It was also on this day that the uh, Holy Spirit was poured out upon the church on on the day of Pentecost. But then justice went on a step further and said, and we worship on Sunday because it was on the first day that God said, let there be light and light shined into the darkness. And so we worship on the first day because we are called the lights of God to go into a world that is in darkness. And so from the very beginning, the church understood we are first day worshipers. It's the Lord's day. 
And so we, we do so in the morning because on the first of the day, the first day, we're giving him the first fruit of this day. The worship, get this, here's something that's going to knock your weave off. Listen, the worship does not begin when we begin the first note of music at 11 o'clock. The Lord's Day worship begins when we decide to rise up and make our way into the house of God on the Lord's Day. That is the moment your worship begins. Oh, y'all got getting this. You rising up saying, I'm heading to the house of the Lord because it's the Lord's day is a statement of worship. It's a declaration that I'm honoring him in my worship by giving him the day. The Lord's day. His day. Now, 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 I, I'm going to bring this home here in a minute. But when we set aside the first fruit of our time, it is in itself holy worship. We worship with our time. And by giving him the first fruit of our time, Sunday morning, the first of the day, Sunday, the first day of the week, when we give him our time, we're making him Lord over our time. Y'all got this, guys. Listen. All week long, I'm running where I want to run, doing what I want to do, fulfilling obligations I've made for myself, responding to the beckon of this person and that person. All week long, I've been carving out my week as I said fit. But this day, this morning, I cease from my own doings because it is the Lord's day and my time belongs to him. Woo. See, here's my challenge to y'all. Learn the art of recapturing Sunday, not only as a day that belongs to him by being in his house, but a day of rest and quiet and peace. Right? Cease from busyness. Families pause to be together. Married folk, quiet yourselves to connect. Observing the Lord's day is not only first fruit worship, it is stewardship of your time. Now get this. How much time do I have? Okay, good. If observing the Lord's day is a first fruit giving, then having divine pauses through the rest of the week is a type of free will offering of your time. I'm here today. You're here today. We've given God the first fruit. It's like tithe. But through the week, as I give him divine pauses, those are free will offerings to the Lord. And I don't want to lose this with our time. I'm speaking of having divine pauses in our day, every day. We used to call these personal devotions, devotions, but I like the divine pause uh, uh, I, uh, worldology here. For me, I, I have a divine pause every morning. I love the, I'm not a morning person. Uh, Y'all know this. My wife knows this. Uh, uh, I don't, if I'm, I can get up early. I get up early. But I don't talk early. Okay. I need to be up an hour or two before I start sp saying the word here and there. Now, sometimes y'all may text me. I get a text at 6, 630. I'm awake. I'll text you back because I don't have to talk. But, but, uh, but if you call me, I'm just going to look at my phone. I'm not going to answer. Right? So you can text me at 6 or 6.30 in the morning. I'll respond. But listen, I, I'm not a morning, but, I, but it's the early quiet of the day. I, I get up. I get my shower so it can start the wake-up process. I get dressed for the day, and I grab a giant mug of coffee, and I sit with my Bible in front of me. And for about 
I don't know, hour, hour and a half. I read, meditate, write notes, read, meditate, write notes. As I'm reading, something provokes me. I pray. I pray for different things. And, and it's just my quiet time. And, and, I, and I love it. That's my divine pause. I like it because it gives him the first of my day. And, and, and what you're doing, in fact, I'm asking you, do you have a divine pause in your life daily? And if you don't, I'm challenging you, do it. Do you bring your busyness under control by having a moment dedicated to divine rest? Because that is worship. It is your free will offering of your time to the Lord. And it is an act of worship without a song. It is an act of worship without any fanfare. It's an act of worship that nobody sees and you can't even be recognized for it. It is you and God. Y'all with me, guys? One more thing, and I'm going to wrap it up with this. There's another way of worshiping God with your time, and, and that is this. When we offer our time to serve, it is an intimate act of worship. Everybody in the house, hear me. Everyone who serves in this church, hear me. And everyone who wants to serve in this church, Hear me this morning. Serving in the house of God or serving people is a offering of time that is an intimate form of worship. We are bringing our busyness under control by being a steward of our time. It comes in the form of giving of our time outside ourself. We call it service. Scripture calls it servanthood. And, and 1 Corinthians 9 and 19, Paul said, I'm, even though I'm free from all men, I don't have obligations, I've made myself a servant to everybody that I may win the more. I like that. I have no obligation to it, but I make myself a servant. In Galatians 5, 13, we're, we're commanded, love one another how? By serving one another. And so there's this servanthood. I give you a whole bunch of scriptures on this. But when we offer our time to serve, it's an intimate act of worship. It sends a strong statement about what we value, right? You hear it all the time. I just don't have enough time. Just don't have enough time. Listen, unless you're in the military, we are in control of our time. And we have, more, we have more say about the use of our time than we let on. Here's the truth. And you've heard it by old folk. People have time for what they make time for. You ever hear old folks say that? You just did. People have time for what they make time for. I've, I, I'll say this also. People often make time for what it is they value most. Come on, somebody. And we as worshipers, we see ourselves as stewards over the time God has given us. Then we have to learn how to worship God through the offering of our time. And the worship with our time is like sowing spiritual seed. It always comes back to us in our blessings. So let me tell y'all something, guys. You guys that were here yesterday morning doing bread ministry, gathering bread, bagging it up, carrying it out to the community, to, to older folk and needy people, and you do it every other Saturday faithfully, and you're doing it month after month, let me tell you something. There is blessing in this. You are worshiping God with your time. You are sowing spiritual seed that will come back to you. You are saying this is valuable to me because it's valuable to God. It is an act of worship. Don't give it up. Don't give up doing it. Keep worshiping God in your time. Many of you serve here and you serve in various ways. Sometimes it may feel like work to you cleaning or 
putting videos and reels together, our setting up and taking down, our cooking, our helping with a smooth operation of Sunday service, our preparing early to work with the kids, or showing up early for music, or sorting clothes in the clothing pantry, or repairing things around the grounds, and all the things that you may do to serve. If you're not careful, it will feel like work, and you'll treat it like a duty. But that's the legalistic view of it. It's the way we would look at it if we were law followers. But listen, we are not under the law or legalism. Your time is like the giving of money. It's a type of offering to the Lord in worship. Yeah. Don't discount the blessing of service time in the house of God. Y'all hearing me, young adults, busy bees running around with cameras? Don't discount the blessing. And I wish all the children's workers, I know Arali is down. Don't discount the, uh, there's a big blessing in discipling kids. Don't you ever, that's the heart of Jesus. Don't discount, you're not doing a duty. It's not a job. It's not work. <laughs> Y'all hearing me? We always go back and forth with my mother-in-law, because she sees cooking as work. My wife and I see cooking as joy. We love to cook. Sometimes we cook things together. Uh, and um, it's, sometimes we learn new dishes. But we love cooking for people. Our young adults know. When they come over, we enjoy cooking for them. They sometimes, Can we bring something? No. You're robbing us of joy. We, we're cooking for y'all. And, and it's, it's, not, it's not work for us. So we go, to, we go back home, and we're in the kitchen cooking. My mother will say, well, that's just way too much work. And I say, it's not work. It's joy. It's not work. It's ministry. But if we're not careful, guys, and my mother-in-law watches these sermons, so I'm not saying this just. <laughs> but if we're not careful. We'll do the same thing in the house of God. We start seeing it as duty, chore, and work. That's legalism. No, it's worship. Because the giving of your time is a free will offering to the Lord. And it's a stewardship of your time. And God will bless your worship. Y'all getting with me, guys. So here's what I'm telling you. If you're serving, keep serving. If you're not serving yet, see somebody. We'll get you serving. Because the giving of your time is worship. And it will shape how you give. You will give your time faithfully. You'll give your time joyfully. You'll give your time with a good spirit. You'll give your time seasoned with grace and the fruit of the spirit. When you realize you're worshiping Jesus in your time. And it will cause the giving of your time to be a sweet aroma to the Lord. Ooh, somebody come, come give me some time on the piano. Look, Colossians says this. Colossians says this. And is this a recruiting sermon? Yeah, it is. We got a lot to do this year, a lot coming up. We need you. But listen, Colossians 3, 23 through 24 says this. Whatever you do, do it heartily. As to the Lord, not to men, not for me, not for anybody in this room. We do it to the Lord, knowing that from the Lord, you're going to receive of the inheritance for you. You serve, say it out loud, the Lord Christ. Wow. Stand with me this morning. I finished three minutes early. Should I ramble for the next three minutes? Wrap it up. Listen. Time. Our ladies got together last Sunday night up at our place. Chewed on chicken and made plans for the year. <laughs> Opening up all kinds of cool ways to worship God with your time. Jump on board to find out. Get a calendar. We talked about stuff in the meeting last night, our annual conference. Stuff coming up, leading up to Easter, leading up to our celebration on June the 2nd. 
when we celebrate the burning of the note, declaring to the spiritual realm that City Mission is here to stay. But we are making plans. And plans happen when people worship God with their time. Men, 1,700 were coming here today. We'll feed you something. That's not why we're gathering. We're going to lay it out, the vision for ourselves for the year. Be part of it. Come on. Young adults, you guys in your 20s, we need you. We need young minds here tonight. I can't be the only one. We need you to come on alongside. But you know what we're going to be doing? We're going to be de dedicating how we're going to serve the Lord with our time. Every head bow. Father, I thank you, Lord. Thank you for these that have gathered today on this first day, this first of the morning, to worship you on the Lord's day, your day. Bless them, God, for being in the house. Go with them in a powerful way in their living rooms, in their dorm rooms, in their, in, in their barracks, wherever they live. Go with them today. And Lord, let them have peace. Let them have quiet and let them have fellowship. Bring our men back in the house of the Lord this afternoon, Father, and let us, God, worship together as men, shoulder to shoulder and face to face. Father, I'm praying these blessings. Every head bowed. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, I, I really want to be part of the church. I want to be part of the body. I want to be part of what God's doing. But I haven't been living the life of a Christian. I haven't, I'm not saved or I'm running from God. If that's you today, come on, I want to pray with you. No need to run any further. Stop the running. Run right to the foot of the cross this morning. And guess what? He wants to save you, cleanse you, receive you as his son or daughter add your name to the book of life and declare you his own and he'll do it if you'll come to him in repentance and confession that Jesus is the Christ the son of the living God crucified, buried, but risen again and coming for us soon if you believe that if you believe that his blood paid the penalty of your sin you believe that and that he's your high priest ready to save you if you call upon him you know that's the truth. Come quickly. Come quickly. Father, in the name of Jesus, if there's any in this house, if there's any of this house, guys, you hear, y'all come stand at these altars and face this congregation. Be ready in case we need to pray, please. Any in this house that is ready to make their peace with the Lord, now's the time. Come. Father, I pray, God, that you would sweep over this congregation. Your presence would convict hearts. Don't let anybody leave this place without knowing that they must be saved. And if they do walk out this door, don't let go of them. Holy Spirit, chase them down all week long. I pray this in the name of the Lord. Somebody in the house and you need healing in your body. I know our brother Anthony needs a touch. Uh, and I know we've had others we prayed for. Maria lost her dad. Sister Yinka needs a healing touch. We're going to pray for them in closing. But if you're here today, we believe in the laying on of hands, the elders of the church anointing the sick with oil, and the prayer of faith raises up the sick. If that's